Hi guys, welcome back. I shall be now discussing regarding Zollinger Eliasson syndrome, which is also called as a gastrinoma. The usual question that will be asked to you will be with respect to the site of this tumor. Please appreciate the fact that the most common site of G cells is the stomach. But this tumor is not found in the stomach. The number one site where this would be encountered would be answered by you as the duodenum. Though you can see a illustration of the gastrinoma triangle, I'll hand draw the gastrinoma triangle before you subsequently to actually help you understand the boundaries which can be asked in a relatively anatomy come pathology come medicine based question. I repeat the statement once again, the overall commonest site of this tumor happens to be the duodenum, but the most common site of G cells is the stomach. It is duodenum followed by pancreas followed by stomach in that order that you need to remember. We will now see what's going to actually happen in the person who's going to be having hypergastrinemia and would be having even hyperchlorhydria. You see, the objective of this discussion is to explain to you that how in a multiple choice question would you differentiate hyperchlorhydria caused by H. pylori versus one caused by Zollinger Eliasson syndrome. The question can begin by describing a young female, 30 to 50 years of age, and that's also the age at which most of the time even PUD can be presenting. The opening line of a case-based scenario will always describe epigastric pain and usage of PPIs by these patients. And most of the time nowadays, PPIs are available over the counter. I mean, you most of the time don't even need a doctor's prescription for it. So this person has been using PPIs for an undiscriminately long period of time. And the key word in the question will be, and that will tell you that this is not an H. pylori based question, will be presence of diarrhea. Now, when I describe this, the usual query from most doctors is that why would we be having diarrhea in Zollinger Eliasson syndrome? Then one of the reasons that you need to understand and appreciate is that there is more acid production. So overall, I would say that the amount of secretions produced in the GI tract is more. So if the secretions is more, I can put the word volume overload, though traditionally we use the word volume overload for cardiology you know, when we talk about heart failure. But I just want to say that the total GI secretions is more. My next statement will sound more convincing to you. In this particular patient, the more acid will contribute to acidic pH in the duodenum. Now, please appreciate that in the duodenum, we have release of bile and that causes an alkaline pH. But here, the more acid is causing an acidic pH in the duodenum. What will it cause? It will cause inactivation. By negative sign, I mean inactivation of the pancreatic enzymes. You see, the pancreatic enzymes can be like amylase or lipase. So, because the pancreatic enzymes are inhibited, so sugar won't be absorbed, even fat may not be absorbed. So, the condition will be akin to what we study even in, uh, I would say, osmotic diarrhea that amylase and lipase are not working. So sugar is unabsorbed and the fat is also unabsorbed. The third reason that can explain the diarrhea component is direct mucosal damage. You see the small intestine is having acid coming in. This influx of acid which is coming from the stomach in large amounts. You see the tumor is present in the duodenum. But when it will produce this hormone gastrin, then it will stimulate the parietal cells. So, so lots of acid coming from the stomach will cause direct mucosal damage to the small intestine. And therefore, again, I can say symptoms akin to osmotic diarrhea can develop in a person that he says that once I stop eating, then the diarrhea might improve because osmotic diarrhea is always characterized by this presentation that if you stop eating, there is no osmotic challenge. In these patients also, similar kind of profile will be given. Epigastric pain on a long-term basis, use or abuse of uh, PPIs and antacids and simultaneously a diarrhea presentation which is not encountered with respect to H. pylori. He might waste your time by describing features of gastroesophageal reflux disease where one of the classical features is retrosternal pain. Others can be that if the acid goes up, it can go into the vocal cord. So there can be chemical laryngitis causing hoarseness of voice, chemical tracheitis contributing to nocturnal cough in the patient. So point number three might be just a time wasting tactic used by the examiner. You are aware of the fact that this condition can be associated with multiple endocrine neoplasia type one. I'll just use a different ink to highlight it. Though I have discussed multiple endocrine neoplasia separately, I'm just reminding you once again that there are three tumors. Each of them begin with alphabet P in this case. This could be a pituitary adenoma, which could be overproducing prolactin. Then when you come down to the second P, it could be a parathroid adenoma. Now, this is very interesting. The parathroid adenoma will contribute to hypercalcemia and hypercalcemia is like adding fuel to the fire because you know from physiology that calcium causes more acid secretion. Hypercalcemia 
or parathyroid adenoma if it is coexisting with a zollinger ellison syndrome the condition will worsen so you will have to operate and remove the parathyroid adenoma also when i discuss the treatment part i'll describe to you how would you image for a parathyroid adenoma but i now come to the third p that is a pancreatic adenoma i have explained that the leading pancreatic adenoma can be non functional or can be insulinoma but in men one it is not gonna be answered by you as insulinoma in multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1 the pancreatic adenoma that you will encounter will be answered by you in the exam as zollinger ellison syndrome and a combination of zollinger ellison and hypercalcemia is a disaster because more calcium will cause more acid production because these tumors can coexist it is thereby important that you will be asking this person for family history of uh, kidney stones you see there is a possibility that a sibling might be having a similar kind of a problem or the parent might have suffered from a similar kind of a problem i'm writing it in two separate points but my output is still the same even in this person also no if his sibling is not involved he could have had this problem past medical history of kidney stones can be present please listen to the discussion of multiple endocrine neoplasia where i have told that at least two out of three tumors should be present to make a diagnosis so it could be in the same patient or they could be a familial basis that could be demonstrated the point is kidney stones point to hypercalcemia the more calcium is because of a parathyroid adenoma which will be scanned using a sista mb scan i'll write the name of sista mb scan subsequently the bad news is that this cancer can turn malignant also as any tumor if it turns malignant then the metastasis would go to the liver and therefore when you're doing a per abdominal examination in these patients if you are going to feel a stony hard consistency if you are going to have a hard consistency or a stony hard consistency written of the liver edge because when you palpate a person you can definitely feel in any person having metastasis the liver can be enlarged so the liver edge will be having a hard consistency i can say that if in your practice you have ever felt a stony hard liver even one if you have appreciated in your life that's enough to last you a lifetime i shall now be talking regarding work up of these patients and first of all i'll describe a upper ge endoscopy finding in fact this will the examiner will be rather leading you to the diagnosis by either writing the statement multiple duodenal ulcers now why that's important is because with h pylori you usually have a solitary ulcer in the first part of the duodenum or duodenal cap but here he might talk about more than one or he might say the word giant duodenal ulcer in fact sometimes in these patients the ulcer might be present in the second part of the duodenum traditionally h pylori causes peptic ulcer or duodenal ulcer in the first part here a typical site can be mentioned obviously the routine site will anyway be present but the size can be relatively bigger or they can be more than one so if you read terms like multiple duodenal ulcers giant duodenal ulcers a typical locations like the second part of duodenum the examiner is leading you to the diagnosis of zollinger ellison because in india h pylori is common so i have anyway done a breath urea test i've written a short form here but is breath urea test which is turning out to be negative in this chap and when i did a endoscopy i also took a scraping of the stomach wall and i tested it for clo test called urease and it turned out to be negative as well it is important to obviously rule out a concomitant h pylori infection in the person the next investigation that i shall be doing in these patients would be pth assay because they could be concomitant parathyroid adenoma causing excess of pth serum calcium will also aid you in the diagnosis you can also check for the values of pancreatic polypeptide because lots of pancreatic tumors might actually be producing pancreatic polypeptide though it may not cause any manifestation but at least it tells you that there is a tumor present prolactin levels will also be helpful because it can pick up a prolactinoma which is associated with men in point number 3 of investigations i am trying to check for whether the person is having a multiple endocrine neoplasia associated or not we now come to one of the most important parts of this discussion where he will say what is the investigation choice for this condition what is the best test for tumor localization if he specifies the word investigation choice for this condition your answer will be not given as endoscopic ultrasound or a ct or mri because those are for anatomical localization first you need to demonstrate there is a tumor and then you need to demonstrate what is the tumor producing the investigation choice for this condition should be answered as secretin study here you will be checking the values of fasting gastrin you see in you and me when we eat food that is where gastrin rises and then there is more acid production but in this chap even in fasting state 
the values of fasting gastrin can be 10 times of what is present in you and me. So obscenely high values like 1000 picograms. I mean, you don't need to remember the value, but I just want to tell you the fact that I mean 10 times more elevation of gastrin can be written. Another term that will be useful for diagnosis will be the word basal acid output or it might say basal acid output divided by maximal as out acid output ratio. Basal acid output values given in the question of more than 15 milliequivalents per hour or this ratio more than 0.6 again contribute to the fact that there is definitely a tumor present in this person. I also want to tell you that fasting gastrin levels can be falsely elevated. Here there is a tumor so it is elevated but he can ask you what are the medical conditions where you can be having falsely elevated gastrin values. One would be PPIs. You see when you give PPIs on long term basis they are suppressing acid so by feedback the values of gastrin can definitely increase. Hypergastrinemia is also a feature with helicobacter pylori. It can be seen even with gastric outer obstruction, seen with a gastric ulcer and even in gastric ulcer discussion, I have highlighted that though there is a chlorhydria, gastrin levels are still elevated. So you should be very sure while evaluating the fasting gastrin levels that there should be no fast, false elevations present and you can obviously supplement the diagnosis with the BAO and a BAO MAO ratio. Now comes the aspect of tumor localization. For tumor localization, I would like to hand draw the aspects of gastrinoma triangle in this case. The green can be taken as representation of the gallbladder. Now I am drawing the cystic duct. Then I have drawn the common hepatic which will then enter into the common bile duct. Using a separate color, I have highlighted the duodenum. This is the first part of the duodenum. So I have written D1, the second part and the third part subsequently. And uh, present here is the head and the body and the tail of the pancreas. So H, B and T basically means head, body and tail of the pancreas. Please follow my lines very carefully here because these could be a theory based question in which he can definitely mention the anatomical aspects as well. I am going to draw a line which is going to be cutting across from the junction of the cystic duct to the common hepatic and this line will bisect the pancreas between the head and the body. Now. I will draw a line from this area and it will cut the second and the third part of the duodenum. And if I just complete the triangle here, I'm going to call it a gastrinoma triangle. Let's do it again. I'll just zoom it in for your convenience. I have drawn, you can take a point here. We can just call it one. The point is junction of the cystic duct with the common hepatic duct. Point number two is where the head and the body of the pancreas, which is shown in blue is meeting. Now draw a line from the Line, the point number two is where the head and the body pancreas are meeting and cut a line or draw a line that bisects or cuts the second part of the duodenum from the third part of the duodenum D2 and D3 and therefore you have is a gastrinoma triangle. This is where this tumor is located and the surprising thing guys is that this tumor could be very small. I mean if I just zoom it in this tumor could be hiding inside the wall of the duodenum. See the tumor is very small. It is present in the wall of the duodenum and hunting for this tumor or searching for this tumor is like looking for a tumor in a or looking for a needle in a haystack. Therefore, if the question specifically says what is the IOC for this condition? Yes, it is a secretin study. But if he specifies in the exam, what is the best way for tumor localization? Your answer would be given as endoscopic ultrasound. Why will you not answer a CT scan? Why will you not answer a MRI? Because the tumor at the moment is very small. You are aware of the fact that if any tumor is less than 1.5 centimeter or 15 millimeter, it may not be visualized by a CT or a MRI. In Harrison, if you follow the table, it is mentioned the best way for tumor localization is endoscopic ultrasound. I'll repeat the fact once again, where would you locate the tumor? Most of the time it will be present in the duodenum. It can be first or second part of the duodenum as well. The tumor can also be in the second part of the duodenum. Though obviously first part of duodenum is the common side, but it can even be in the second part of the duodenum. After duodenum, this could be pancreas, this could be stomach. Now the reason why I'm repeating this is because there is lots of time possibility that he might even ask you sites outside the traditional ones, like the tumor could be hiding in the mesentery. Or for that matter of fact, it might be hiding even in the ovaries and even in the heart. Looks very surprising, but these are the sites where the gastrinoma has been documented. So there is a distinct possibility that instead of asking you the conventional sites, he might even ask you the rare ones. Let's revise mesentery, ovary and heart can also be involved in this case. I would like to highlight my statement imaging modality of choice. 
for evaluation of a gastrinoma or Zollinger Ellison is to be answered as endoscopic ultrasound. Why am I writing it again is because he will modulate and change the MCQ slightly. The language of the question will be what is the imaging modality of choice for metastatic Zollinger Ellison syndrome slash gastrinoma. You see when the cancer will spread you need to go for scans. The scan that you will go in this case would be answered as somatostatin scintigraphy. I repeat my facts once again and a lot of guys I have seen they casually listen to it and they mess up on it. So please be very very particular for these two statements. In fact, I would rate this particular slide as the most important slide of this discussion of Zollinger Ellison. I mean the anatomical boundaries can be asked and the radiological aspects, anatomy, radiology and the clinical aspect of epigastric pain with diarrhea can be asked in a single question only. So do take a note of the fact that is he asking you a standard Zollinger Ellison which is benign or if he is talking about a malignant one then obviously uh, somatostatin scintigraphy will be answered by you. Coming for the treatment of these patients I need to heal the ulcers. The treatment of choice or the drug of choice for these patients will vary. The drug of choice is obviously PPI because these ulcers the giant doodle ulcer will perforate. So I need to give PPI to this patient sometimes even twice a day for even six weeks and even longer because I want to heal the ulcers. Along with this, I will be utilizing a bit of physiology. You are aware that somatostatin is the inhibitory hormone of the GI tract. So I can be using here lanreotide. Lanreotide would be a long acting derivative of octreotide that can be used in this case. So if we are going to be using injectable octreotide derivatives that is lanreotide, you will be able to control the symptom profile of this person. The surgery is to be done but we usually operate on these patients when the size of the tumor is something in the range of more than 1.5 centimeter that is it's at least picked up on a CT or MRI you know. Otherwise looking for a tumor lesser than this in the wall of the duodenum is like looking for a needle in the haystack you never ever gonna find it. So you need a MRI localization subsequently if it is bigger, if it is smaller, I know it's endoscopic ultrasound picking it up, but I'll, I'll treat it medically. So initial treatment for a smaller tumor is a medical one. If it becomes bigger, then we'll go for a surgical resection in this case. Lots of time you will notice that these patients can be having a concomitant hypercalcemia. They could be having elevated PTH, which tells you that there is a parathroid adenoma present. So in the same MCQ, he can again test your knowledge of uh, radiology by asking you what is the imaging modality that you will use to locate a parathroid adenoma. Your answer in this case would be given as technetium 99 scan. This technetium 99 scan that I'm writing before you was also discussed in cardiology in the discussion of chronic stable angina. So I'm talking about system EB scan. Mark my words, they're not technetium 99 pertechnet. Technetium 99 pertechnet is used for identification of Mikkel's diverticulum. Technetium 99 per technate written, it is for identification of Mikkel's diverticulum. Technetium 99 you read two times, one in cardiology, chronic stable angina where your blockages in the coronaries and then to identify a parathroid adenoma because we need to go in for a resection of a parathroid adenoma also. So lots of time these patients if they're having two tumors, they may occur simultaneously or in different decades of life, that's a separate issue. But if parathroid adenoma is present, it will be worsening the manifestations of the linger license syndrome. If there are going to be METs to the liver that you can read from surgery, if there's METs to the liver, then we can go for hepatic wedge resection. But if it has extensively spread, then nothing much can be done for the patient. The prognosis in those circumstances will be relatively poor. Most questions on the management part of this condition will be happy to hear these two drugs from you, PP and Lanreotide. They usually will not go into the surgical domain of it because our objective is early identification. So if you get this particular slide right with respect to the anatomical issue of gastrinoma triangle, with respect to the location of the tumor and how do you, I mean, identify where the tumor is there or not. Obviously, routine tumors can be picked up by CTMRI. But here the peculiarity where a marked with star should definitely be given a priority. And when I finish it, I just want to uh, emphasize this point once again. If you are going to read a question that's going to talk about epigastric pain and question is looking like a standard peptic ulcer disease, do take care of the note that is he talking about concomitant diarrhea also. Because if that is given in a case-based scenario, the answer is not a standard H. pylori 1. It is going to be Zollinger Ellison. 
or another hint is that endoscopy of a person with epigastric pain was done and he is mentioning a giant duodenal ulcer multiple duodenal ulcers atypical site second part of the duodenum is where the ulcer will ulcer is usually seen in the first part of the duodenum with dutch pylori so those are the key words that i want you to identify i mean most of these longish questions no can be easily identified with the keywords in the question so if you just keep a focus on that i'm very sure you will be able to get a good strike rate in this particular topic thank you so much for hearing me out on this topic